Hello and welcome to the Mining Revolution, a turning point in South African history, part one. So far, you've covered quite a lot of information about the Mineral Revolution. So let's just go back a bit. The Mineral Revolution in South Africa started with the discovery of diamonds in Kimberley and intensified with the discovery of deep level gold on the Witwatersrand. By the time that gold was discovered, African kingdoms had lost their independence. During the gold mining revolution, patterns of land and labor were established and continued into the 20th century. The mineral revolution brought about the changing of balance of power in South Africa due to diamond mining, gold mining, and the foundations of racial segregation by Britain, who incorporated, meaning introduced, labor control and land expansionism. The discovery of diamonds and gold changed the South African economy significantly. European investments flowed in. International banks and private lenders increased cash and credit available to local farmers, miners and prospectors, and they in turn placed growing demands for land and labor on the local African populations. South Africa was drawn into the international economy through its exports, primarily meaning mainly diamonds and gold, and through its own increasing demand for a variety of agricultural imports. The cycle of economic growth was stimulated by the continual expansion of the mining industry, and with newfound wealth, consumer demand fueled higher levels of trade. It all sounds great in theory. I mean, South Africa is now on the map. We are now part of the international economic cycle. But let's look at the reality of the mineral revolution. Before the mineral revolution, South Africa was experiencing a financial depression at the time. This means that the country didn't have any money. The majority of its people, those indigenous to the land, were actively occupied with agricultural and pastoral farming. So they were farming for survival. They had accepted the struggle for survival, but were inhibited, meaning they were limited, by their lack of technical knowledge and resistance to innovation. This means that they resisted new methods and they didn't like change. Neither were their white counterparts spared the toil. So even those who had moved to South Africa back then were also experiencing the hardships of the land. Thanks to the Merino sheep, which had been introduced in the Southeast Cape by the 1820 settlers, wool was the only exportable item. The country was thought to have no significant minerals or metals. The whites who went to seek their fortunes at the diamond diggings came from the British colonies and Boer Republics of South Africa, or from Britain, Australia, the USA and other countries. Many arrived as penniless diggers, hoping to strike it rich. This means that they left their own countries, came to South Africa, but they were very poor or had very little. So they might have used all their savings just to cross the ocean to get to South Africa. Others came with a little capital, meaning that some did come to the country with a bit of money. And then they set up businesses as traders, diamond buyers, or barkeepers. Although one may see the growth and expansion of industries as a positive thing, South Africa now had the attention of the world and everyone wanted a part of its wealth. The effects of the mineral revolution were vast and long lasting. These effects may be divided into the following categories, political, social, economic and environmental effects. Let us briefly look at each of these categories to understand the full impact of the mineral revolution on South African history. The political effects. It influenced the British ambitions, meaning their desire 
to govern or control the interior parts of South Africa. Remember, in the beginning, their colonies were along the coast. But now, all of a sudden, there was an interest in the middle of South Africa. This resulted into incorporation of diamond fields at Kimberley by the British so that they could have control of the mining industry. It created enmity, meaning it created a dislike between the British and the Boers. The Boers lost their land to the British, which is why they had moved more inland. Now the British were taking over that land too. Strangely enough, it also influenced the introduction of apartheid, meaning segregation, to live apart. The policy that separated the people into races. Remember the mining compounds and the different rules and regulations according to the colour of your skin? It led to the imbalance of power between the whites and the blacks. Africans totally lost their independence. Although the whites were the minority, meaning they were less white people, they managed to gain control of South Africa through different laws. The mining revolution also marked the formation of the Federation of South Africa by the British in 1877. This made South Africa one country under the rule of the British, even though the Boers were against it. This resulted in some very unhappy people. The social effects of the mining revolution. There was cultural transformation due to cultural contacts. The number of white settlers increased and this affected the natives culture. The native cultures were being exposed to more European or westernized ways of doing things. And so this would naturally start to change the culture of the country. There was also an increase of racial segregation due to new laws and legislations. People being told where they can live, who to live with when working on the mines, etc. The Transvaal was changed from being agricultural and pastoral. So the Transvaal used to be a farming community and suddenly became a highly industrialized society. Hence the birth of the city of Johannesburg. There was population growth due to immigration. People from nearby places like Mozambique and Zimbabwe moved to South Africa. There was the spread of diseases, such as the lung disease and the spread of tuberculosis due to the mining conditions. This would have led in a lot of loss of life. There was also family separation. Labor migration separated families in various places. For example, Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Angola. You see, the father of the family would move to South Africa leaving his family in his home country. The economic effects. It reconstructed the economy of South Africa. In the beginning, South Africa was agricultural. All of a sudden, it was industrial and commercial. It facilitated the development of a transport system, such as the railway link from Natal and Cape Town all the way through to the borders of the Transvaal. Remember, that's where the song Shosha Lawsa comes from, the train carrying them across the country. It led to the transformation of Kimberley into an important mining and commercial centre with a large population. Other towns like Johannesburg also grew. The mining industry offered employment opportunities. Capital obtained allowed for further investments that offered more jobs, and so the cycle continued. The export trade also grew. Harbours like Cape Town were used for export and became very, very busy. The rise of the South African Industrial Revolution was also a result of the Mineral Revolution. Different industries emerged because they were needed, such as food processing, iron and steel industries. It also led to the expansion of agriculture because more food was needed to feed the industrial workers and miners and so farmers needed to farm more food for commercial purposes and not just for survival. 
Unfortunately, the whites took more land for mining and agricultural activities, leaving the Africans landless. They did this through different laws and legislations. There was also the emergence of large mining companies, and one that we did learn about, the De Beer Consolidated Mines, which was started under Cecil John Rhodes. Lastly, we look at environmental effects. And this is one where the earth will struggle to recover. There was loss of biodiversity. Mining activities destroyed landscapes and forests, leading to loss of wildlife. Water pollution by mining also killed aquatic organisms. For example, there's the disappearance of water weeds that used to be found in Kimberley since the 1860s. And this was due to the pollution by chemicals from mining. We also have what is known as deforestation. Large stretches of land have been cleared to allow mining processes. Mining in South Africa required large areas that were cleared, leading to the loss of forests throughout the areas where minerals were extracted, hence leaving the land bare. Without forests, we have no animals. Environmental pollution. Land, water and air were polluted by wastes from mines and industries. Chemicals, fumes and solid particles polluted the environment. For instance, in Transvaal, the dumping of rotten industrial materials in water canals led to the increase of polluted water. We have also watched documentaries where we can see the long lasting effect of gold mining in the Transvaal area. Land degradation. Harmful materials like chemicals from mines dumped into land destroyed its quality. The reality is that the environmental management systems and restoration procedures were not in place. Not like we have today, where some companies are trying to make a difference. So what is happening now with regards to mining? Surely the world has seen the devastating effects. What is happening around the world? And what can we do about it? This mine was once dug for profit. Now its coal is barely enough for the residents that rely on it to survive. It's the only source of heat this cold winter, though. In one self-dug shaft, one man tells us he can't afford to buy. So he has to come here. We ask him if he's worried about the risks. He says he takes precautions. But his neighbour's children don't always tread so carefully. Ah, Alita Maguda shows us burns on her daughter's legs. She was playing and the ground gave way. It looks solid, but it's burning from underneath. The kids were playing and she just walked over it. Yeah, Left alone, cracks have become gaping holes. As underground, parts of these abandoned mines slowly burn. Over the years, there have been fatalities, but just living here is a slow death anyway. Now, when the wind blows, it whips up this toxic dust, which seems to lodge in your throat. It makes your eyes and your nose sting. This has to be one of the most polluted stretches of land on the planet. In fact, it's very hard to imagine how anybody could live here. The law protects communities like these, requiring unprofitable mines to be wound down responsibly. That hasn't happened here. One NGO working to hold alleged wrongdoers to account says there's little political will. I mean, the benchmark to take is that uh, if this company have some of the politically linked people in their, in their what you call in their board of directors as part of their board of directors, it give us some kind of uh, security net. They know actually that uh, certain things they can plot, certain things they can overcome. If uh, the state comes very hard on them, they can always go to those individuals who will talk back to the politicians, 
behind and there can be kickbacks and certain things they can just be overlooked. Government says it wants operations in the area expanded. No one was available for interview about possible downsides. Parents here aren't surprised since their over-aged faces looked far younger. Very little here seems to have changed. Guy Henderson, CCTV, Fitbank in South Africa's Mpumalanga province. Gold is one of the most precious metals in the world and has run the gamut from its use as currency to jewelry and even electronic plating and infrared shielding. But for many people, the cost far outweighs its intrinsic value. Seeker Stories went to South America to learn about some of the worst exploitation, both human and environmental. Gold is maybe the most universal shorthand there is for value and for greed. The ancient Egyptians were obsessed with it, European explorers marauded through South America in search of it, and American cities like San Francisco and Seattle rose to prominence because of it. It's a big part of our history as humans. Looking at all that, our obsession with gold also seems historical, sort of old-timey. But that's not at all true. There's still huge demand for gold today. The recession of 2008 helped gold quadruple in value, and a full half of all the gold mined in the world has been mined in the past 50 years alone. But what is different about gold today is how we get... down in every direction. And therein lies the problem. According to Diego, poisoned water has seeped throughout the region, causing stomach cancer in people, illnesses in livestock, and decimated fish populations. And the people of Cajamarca, who were promised new wealth from the mining economy, haven't all seen a benefit. They see water that is contaminated and economic opportunities that haven't really changed for them. Quality of life has remained the same for many of these people without any of the profits that you assume a gold mine would bring to a region. And so the people have done the one thing that they're able to do about the mines, protest. They're pushing back against foreign corporate influence, ruined natural resources, and a history that somehow has never seemed to change for them. They've been exploited for about 500 years now, ever since the Spanish arrived and started taking the Inca's gold. This, the same story happens wherever you have resource extraction projects. It's a dirty industry which makes private profits and public disasters. For Diego, it all comes back to the value of gold. As expensive as gold is right now, after visiting Cajamarca, Diego sees it as undervalued dangerously so. I realized that gold is cheap because we pay through it through the lives of people who live in gold producing areas, through the lives of people that live in Cajamarca or any region in the world. If you want to see more in-depth content like this, subscribe to Seeker Stories. They will take you around the world sharing stories that surprise, challenge, and inspire you. Like this one about a company that is revolutionizing sustainable energy with an unexpected resource. Environmentally is for deforestation. The leading cause of deforestation is for food production. With algae producing 40 times more per acre, that means if we plant 1,000 acres of algae, that's 40,000 acres of crops that don't need to be planted. Please make sure to like and subscribe to Seeker Stories for more of their documentaries. And thank you for watching.
Billions and billions of tons of mining waste are stored all over Europe. For us, it is an opportunity. For instance, we can recover different metals, which we really need to move to a greener society. And the best part is, from that waste, we can make sustainable building products with a much lower CO2 footprint. With our innovative technologies, we aim to recycle up to 95% of the mining waste.